Hi, and welcome to physics. And in this course we're going to learn several things, not the least of which are concepts like speed, acceleration, force, energy, and a host of others. But before we get started on the actual physics, uh, I want to talk about chapter one just a bit and there's two main points in chapter one that I want to hit and those are the scientific method or the scientific enterprise as your book calls it and um, the metric system and, and how we'll use scientific notation in some, uh, some of the course. So let's talk about the scientific method first. Now there are several different minor variations of the scientific method, but they all uh, have the same overarching structure. So if you've learned the scientific method in, in high school or in a different college course, uh, just bear with me for a few moments. Um, but the basic idea of the scientific method is to test ideas. Okay, And in fact... Uh, another word for science in general, or uh, another phrase for science in general, if you wanted to uh, paraphrase or sum up the role of science, it would be the rigorous testing of ideas. Okay, the rigorous testing of ideas. And so that's the root of uh, the scientific method, is that I have uh, an idea uh, about a phenomenon, and I want to test whether my idea is correct or not, or, or uh, we don't re usually say the word proved in uh, science, uh, but in other words, uh, we'll say things like validated. Does my, uh, is my idea validated by um, experimentation, and so on and so forth. And so the basic uh, steps to the scientific method are, number one, you make an observation. Something picks your interest. Something makes you go, hmm, I wonder how that works. And after you've made this observation, you come up with a logical guess, either based on your common everyday experience or uh, something specific about the phenomenon itself. Uh, but you make a specific guess or make an educated guess. And this is what we call the hypothesis. Okay, so to understand a phenomenon, your first step is to make a hypothesis as to why that phenomenon occurs, or what causes it to, to occur, or what effects that uh, phenomenon may have. A classic uh, um, example in this uh, realm is one that your book uses, and that's also of uh, the rainbow. So what causes a rainbow to occur? So you see a rainbow, you make an observation about a rainbow, you see a rainbow and you go, gosh, I wonder why a rainbow happens. What causes a rainbow to occur? So then you notice things about the rainbow. Uh, you notice what times uh, the rainbow occurs. You notice that it doesn't just naturally occur when it's usually just sunny. It almost always happens after a rainstorm. And then you might make a note about where the sun usually is in the sky in relation to the rainbow. And you collect all of these things together, and you then form an official guess as to what causes a rainbow, and that would be your hypothesis. And then number three, you would test your hypothesis. And this can either be through an experiment or an observation. Uh, rainbow wouldn't be that uh, easy uh, without modern technology like garden hoses and things. So if you put yourself uh, in the place of an ancient Egyptian, uh, say, it wouldn't necessarily be easy to create artificially your own rainbow. You might have to wait till the uh, next uh, storm or next at least rain to make an observation. So to test your hypothesis, it can actually be an experiment or an observation. You wait until the next rainstorm comes 
and you see if a rainbow uh, forms or not. Now, if the rainbow does not form, you can't necessarily say, all right, that rain does not cause rainbows. Um, but if a rainbow formed without rain, then you could definitely say that rain was not necessary, or at least a completely necessary component. So just because you make an observation, or you try to make an observation, and you don't find any evidence of that observation, do not make the mistake of thinking that the uh, absence of evidence is the same thing as evidence of absence. Okay. Uh, I'll let you digest that statement for a few minutes, uh, and if you want to, go ahead and pause the video and just think about that statement. Right? I'll write it down. So the uh, absence of evidence, absence of evidence, does not equal evidence of absence. All right, so that'll also be very important. That's a very important minor, uh, uh, well, it's not minor, but it's a, a subtle point, if you will, of the scientific method. Okay, so back to the scientific method. After you've tested your hypothesis, okay, so you've tested your hypothesis. Well, that's a terrible H. Let me rewrite that H. Okay, so you've tested your hypothesis. You have two possible outcomes. Either one, the test is positive, or two, the test is negative. In the first case, the test confirmed your hypothesis or affirmed your hypothesis, and in the uh, negative part, the uh, test rejected your hypothesis. Uh, so if the test is positive, then you can refine slightly the hypothesis based on um, the outcome of the experiment or what have you. And so you just generally refine your hypothesis, make more observations uh, or tests, um, make slash do observations slash tests, okay? And after enough of these tests, <coughs> pardon me, have been conducted, uh, especially by third-party people, so in other words, after your first few experiments, you report your results to your peers, and they go out and they confirm uh, your tests by doing them themselves. Then, after all of those tests have been done, then the hypothesis moves to the realm of theory. Okay. If the hypothesis is negative, then refine and basically go back to the drawing board. All right. So if your hypothesis is negative, you need to refine the hypothesis and uh, cannot call it a theory. So the bottom line here is that only ideas that have been thoroughly thoroughly tested become theory. Okay, um, and that's a very um, important point within the sciences because in reality, for an idea to become a theory, that is really about as high as the idea can achieve, okay? So some people have the mistaken idea that the logical progression with the scientific method is that an idea starts out as a hypothesis and then it moves to theory and then it becomes a law, okay? But that is, in fact, not the case, okay? That is, in fact, not the case that uh, you move from hypothesis to theory to law. 
Okay, so again, a theory thoroughly tested. And an, a law is something that we have simply observed and never seen it deviate from what we've observed. So a law is a, a steady state of observation, if you will. Uh, no observations deviate. So as an example of this, okay, uh, we call them Newton's three laws of motion, if you will, or Newton's universal law of gravitation, but he did not use these uh, terms himself, okay? Um, so when Newton invented these things, uh, and, well, he didn't really invent his own laws, uh, he just coalesced them all into one cohesive mathematical framework, but uh, he never used the word uh, law, uh, he presented them more in the idea of theory. But, for example, okay, Newton's uh, first law of motion, I'll paraphrase it for us, and it says that an object at rest will stay at rest. and an object in motion will stay in motion. Uh, but for our purposes, let's say an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by a force. And this was a very revolutionary statement. Uh, if it weren't for the work of Galileo, then they might have tried to burn um, Newton at the stake for being such a heretic because this flew in the face of 2,000 years worth of ideas. Um, but, so this is his first law paraphrased, and all it says that an object at rest will stay at rest, well that's what we always see of if we don't apply or a push or a pull, i.e. a force to something, then of course it will just stay still. Um, we never observe something to move on its own, an inanimate object that is, not a, a living organism, but an inanimate object, we never observe it to move on its own. It only does so if it has a push or a pull or something akin to those applied to it. Okay, But this first law doesn't state why, in fact, that is. Okay, There's a deep mathematical theory underlying the entirety of Newton's three laws, but it, they don't state that theory themselves. They simply state the laws, and then it's up to us to discover the underlying mathematical theory, and in fact, Newton did that for us, and that's largely what we will be uh, talking about today. So, in other words, don't be confused about what a law is. Okay, A law is simply an observation that we make on a phenomenon that we have never observed it to deviate. Okay. Now that's not exactly true because there are a few things that are termed laws like Bode's Law or something like that that in fact are not really laws, they've just retained the name law. But in general, a scientific law is an observation that we make or a test that we do that we always find the same results over and over and over and over and over again, um, but we don't ne that doesn't necessarily explain. So you could invent a law of rainbows that said that rainbows only appear uh, during rainstorms and they're always opposite the sun. Okay, That would be a law, but that does not tell you why rainbows appear. That does not tell you anything about how the water molecules in the air interact with the light from the sun, or how refraction plays a role, or how the angle of the viewer plays a role, or anything like that. All it says is that the only time you'll see a rainbow is at, during a rainstorm or after a rainstorm and the sun would have to be in a certain position in the sky. Okay, The underlying ideas of how that happens would be the theory. Okay, So I, I make that point because a lot of people complain about uh, the two big controversial theories in science, uh, those of the Big Bang and evolution, and no scientist, no, no scientist being true to their craft would ever say that we know everything there is to know about these two theories, but in fact both have been thoroughly tested. Okay. 
and both make specific predictions that you can then go and try to observe and uh, so on and so forth. And so for somebody to say that the Big Bang or evolution are just theories, okay, they're, they're displaying a very uh, strong misconception about how the scientific method actually works. Both of these ideas only reach the idea of theory after having been thoroughly tested. A, uh, for an object to also become a theory, there, it must meet one more criterion. Okay? A theory must make further testable predictions. or things that we haven't observed yet, or things that we have observed, but that our theory can now explain. <coughs> okay? So for an object to become truly a theory, it must make predictions. Okay? And predictions that we can then go and investigate. So when you hear things uh, in uh, cutting-edge uh, theories in physics, things like string theory or M-theory, Okay, these are really fine ideas, and there's nothing wrong with them, but in the true technical sense, okay, in the true technical sense, because they do make predictions, but we don't have the technology yet, so they really aren't testable yet, string theory is not a true theory in the scientific sense, okay? That doesn't mean there's not a lot of good work being done. That doesn't mean it won't be in the future. But because we cannot make testable uh, observations with the predictions that they make, they're simply uh, beyond what we can uh, truly call a true scientific theory, okay? All right. I'll actually save the uh, scientific notation and metric system for a, another video, um, but this really hits the highlight of um, the chap first chapter and what uh, I really want you to gain from it. Uh, everything else is pretty self-explanatory, so I will leave you to it. Uh, if you have any questions, just give me a holler. All right, see you next time.